share screen. Okay. And so uh, I already talked a little bit about who we are, so I'm just gonna skip right through this. Uh, we are a one-to-one -on, one -one mentoring network. And for people who are just watching starting now, uh, you can register at pbthrough.com. And we're, we're like 95% free, and we always plan on being 95% free. Actually, right now, because we're in beta, we're 100% free. So it's a great time to jump on the site and uh, use all our tools. So why is this talk important? Getting to medical school is hard. It is really, really, really hard. I had a um, doctor mentor uh, of mine, a friend of mine who I used to shadow while I was a pre-med, who after I got in, uh, joked that I had accomplished the hard part getting in, which um, now after four years of medical school, I'm not sure I totally agree with, but it, it definitely felt like that at the time. Um, so just some simple stats. 53,000 people in 2019 applied, uh, but only 21,000 got in. So we're only looking at about a one in two shot of getting in. Um, applicants, the average GPA was about a 3.48. However, the average science GPA was about a 3.66, which means you have very, very little wiggle room for poor grades. Uh, and if you do get a poor grade, you really need a plan for how you're going to address that, how you're gonna move forward from that. And um, if you get questioned about that later, how you're going to answer. So this is another area where if you do get a mentor with us, they can, they can help you out with that. So class selection. So I have three, three interesting choices. And this is, I feel, realistic choices here. You have a biochemistry class at Rutgers where the average grade is a C plus. You have a biochemistry class at Rutgers where the average grade is a B plus. Or you have a biochemistry class at a local community college where the average grade is a B minus. And um, where do you get this info? I mean, you could, you could uh, check out sites like we're going to talk about soon called Rate My Professor, where people report the grades they got. They'll, they'll often s tell you the, uh, the class section they took, the professor they had, and the grade they got with that professor. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people would jump right for B, right? Because it's the, the B plus, um, as opposed to the C plus. Feels like a no brainer. Um, and then class C, people might be wary of it because it's a community college, uh, but there, there are some uh, misunderstandings, misconceptions about the role of community college and how uh, medical schools look at community college classes versus university classes. So anybody in the audience tell me what they would go with? And you don't have to. I, I might call out somebody. How about, how about you, Ali? Which class would you pick? I was an undergrad student. I'm going with class B because I want my GPA to be high. You're going to go with B? I think I'm I, undergrad. I, yeah. that, that's not a bad choice. I might go with B too. Anybody else? Tarun, which one would you pick? Have you taken biochem yet, Tarun? No, I'm not. I didn't take biochem yet. Oh, that's a good one. Biochem 1, biochem 2. I think there might be a legendary biochem 3 out there too. Which, uh, which class would you pick, Tarun? Um, I would probably pick the B plus because GPA. That's, that's very fair. That's very fair. So I probably would have picked B plus two, honestly, because I didn't want to take biochem at a community college level for a few reasons. One, I wasn't sure if I'd get the same rigorous uh, class as I would in college. And two, I wasn't sure if the um, medical schools would give it the same weight as, um, as a college, as a university class. Now, in retrospect, I would have picked pick C in a heartbeat. And I'll, I'll go into the reasons why. So uh, your choice really depends on your dream medical school. Does it give preference to classes at a university level versus a community college level? Not all medical schools, I don't wanna use the word care, but not all of them care. They, they, if you can demonstrate you can perform at the university level and also you're doing good at the community college level, they're fine for that. Because they, they know classes are expensive. You could probably save yourself a couple grand by taking it at a community college level. Um, so that, that's one factor. Another factor is you look at the, uh, the cohort that you're with. So in Rutgers, B plus, C plus, they, they might be artificially dropping down grades because they, they can't give everybody an A, right? So at 
Rutgers, it might be much, much more competitive to get an A or even that B plus than it is at the community college. So that, that's a major consideration to, to think about. Uh, you, could, you could be a B plus student at Rutgers, go to community college, totally rock it, and get an A plus. And when you submit your application to medical schools, that A plus at community college factors in just like an A plus at Rutgers does. They, they don't weight it differently. Um, another thing to think about is who te who's teaching these classes. Is a really distinguished teacher at Rutgers teaching these classes? Is a really distinguished teacher at community college teaching these classes? Is it a really difficult teacher? Does this person have a reputation for not getting anybody an A? Uh, these are things you really have to consider and this is where you should check out and rate my professor or a similar site. Um, and then what are people saying about these grades? Um, how are, are they saying that they didn't have to do any work and they got an A? If that's the case, I mean, that might help you in the short term, but in the long term, when you get to your first semester of medical school and you need to know the biochem, it's gonna hurt you. So also consider your own strengths and weaknesses. Is biochem a class you know that you'll excel in or struggle in? Um, in that case, you know, taking it at Rutgers, if it's something that comes naturally to you, might not be a problem. Um, however, it's something you know that you're really, really gonna struggle with, you could take it at the community college, it might be a little easier there. So the point is that you have to be strategic with your class selection. Uh, biochem is not biochem. It, it, it's not the same class everywhere. It may go over the same content and you should learn the same stuff coming out of it, but how difficult that road is really can change from place to place. Uh, just pick classes that'll maximize your chance for success, but also consider classes in undergrad that you're interested in and that are enriching. So I know um, there's like a, a biochem too. And I don't think they require biochem two, although that may have changed. This, this info may be out of date. But if you really like biochem, I really enjoyed biochem two. It went into a lot of stuff that I did feel was useful for medical school. And um, it was an enriching class. But never lose sight of your end goal. Each step is a step towards getting into med school. So do what you need to do to get your grades up, to get, keep a high GPA and get there. Uh, and don't definitely don't pick the hardest class just to prove something. I have a lot of friends who picked uh, like uh, what do they call it? physical uh, physical chemistry. Um, I think that was the title of it, or materials chemistry, or something like that. And they were just dying all semester. And if you're interested in that, fantastic. If you're just trying to prove to yourself you can take it, well, consider what your end goal is, right? If if that's important to you, fantastic, take it. But if your end goal is just to to go to medical school, you, you, there's a certain amount of risk in taking classes like that. Um, I'm not saying don't take classes like that. I'm just saying be strategic. So take them after you get accepted. That, that's what I'm saying. Get the, get the acceptance letter in the fall and then take your real hard class. Um, and definitely do the work in classes that'll serve you well later. Okay, moving on. So grade, grade charting tools. These are fantastic. Um, they play a huge role both strategically in selecting classes and knowing where you stand in classes and projecting into the future. So there's a lot of online trackers, like I found one, gpatracker.net. There's lots and lots of apps. I used an app that I would update every semester. And the neat thing was I could fill in my current classes and I can put in prospective grades uh, for those classes and I could know where my GPA would be if I got like straight A's all semester. Uh, I could also uh, do things like um, put in um, uh, homework. So uh, let me do um, uh, the subcomponents of a grade. So you would have the, the total grade and then you could weigh the different components like they do with the syllabus. So if they say your homework's worth 15%, you could enter in 15% homework and then you can track each homework assignment. So it lets you know where you're standing at all times and what you gotta do to improve your grades. Uh, Excel charts are great too, if you wanna do it yourself. Um, looking back, I think I would have done that more. I did start to do that in med school and I would recommend um, people do that because you can track where you stand and what you need to get in upcoming blocks. Uh, does anybody, before I go any further, does anybody have any questions? Anybody use any apps currently? Um, I had a question, Nathan. Sure. So if you t take a class and you received a grade, but you weren't happy with what you got, would right. you 
prefer probably retaking the class because especially Rutgers, um, if you mm. fail the class, you can only retake it. And if you're not happy with your grade, like they won't allow you. So would you prefer taking that class at a community college or somewhere else? That's a great question. And that is exactly okay. what I did actually. Um, I, I got like a D in uh, bio, uh, uh, bio, biology uh, when I was a philosophy major. And I went back to William Patterson, who has a similar rule where if you pass the class, you can't retake it. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I was stuck. I said, hey, I was here like 10, 15 years ago. Uh, can I retake this class? And they're like, nope, you still can't. So I went to a community college and I retook it. And so I do recommend if you get a really low grade, um, and definitely a D, definitely an F, retake that class. If you're in the C range, I would all still recommend retaking that class. Okay, uh, retake so, that community college level. Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, so med schools won't really look at you retaking the class at a different community college. They care about the grade. They care about the trend. So you and and the reason why. So they're going to ask you about that grade. The one hundred percent certain they're going to ask you about that grade. They're going to say, hey, why why did you get a D in this class? And then you took it at a community college. Are you sure you can handle the rigors of med school? And as long as you have a good reason why you did poorly, maybe uh, this was your freshman year, uh, maybe something was going on in your life, um, whatever that reason is, I would formulate what that reason is, be confident in expressing that, and say, hey, you know what? Uh, Rutgers has this policy where you can't retake unless you get a, an F in the, in the class. And um, I didn't want to spend all that money. So I, I headed to community college and I, uh, I, I rocked it. It was the same material. We went over the same things. It was a real learning experience. I really growed. That's how you want to approach that. That's how I would recommend. Okay, thank you. No problem. And uh, I have a question. Oh yeah, sure. Um, just like touching upon like the science GP and like upward trend, like yes. what do you think? What do you think is like more important, the upward trend or like total GP and the science GP? Upper trend, one hundred percent, one hundred, no question, no question in my mind. So the um, if you are a a four point oh student and you never and you've never been nothing but a four point oh student, it makes me and uh, a lot of people wonder how you're going to handle uh, difficult times, right? Because Med school, I mean, you, you could just be that super genius who is never going to struggle and you're going to have a photographic memory and just learn everything instantly, right? But most people aren't going to be that way. Most people are going to have a difficult period of time where their grades are going to go down and they're going to uh, admissions committees, the, uh, the people at these med schools are going to wonder, how's this person going to handle stress? How's this person going to handle not getting an A uh, in this class? And so the person who has an upper, upward trend has sent a message, hey, I've, I've had adversity I've, uh, with my studies, and I've responded, and I've overcome that, and I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm on an upward trend. I'm improving. Um, so upward trend, 100%. 100%. May I add one quick thing? Yes. Um, do you agree that the upward trend is very important, especially if you have started off uh, at a low point? And let's say you, you know, first couple of semesters, you were like 3.0 or 2.9, but by the end of junior, senior year, you were rocking three eights and above. That's going to look very good and show that you could, you know, overcome adversity. Um, yes. On the other hand, I, I slightly disagree with one thing Nathan said, is that if you have a 4.0 the entire time, it would look, you may be concerned about how you face adversity. Mm. Yeah, that's true. It could come up. But when it comes to medical school applications, Unfortunately, the filter will sort through GPAs and MCATs from the get-go. Yeah. And like, I mean, if you have a high GPA, don't, <laughs> you shouldn't really be stressing or worrying about any of that deeper stuff. Because um, let's say you have that 3.8, 3.9, but you also have X, like, you worked really hard on your extracurriculars, you were a scribe, you did research, you did multiple things. That also shows the, the missions that, hey, look, he's able to right. uh, juggle a lot of things, as opposed to someone who may have only done that and that's it. And that's where it becomes a little bit of a, maybe you should have added something else. But from, but from an isolated case of a 3.9 is probably going to look better than, you know, a 3.6 with an upward trend just at its face value. Right. That, that is a really good point. And a lot of places will, just like Ali said, just they'll, they'll look at the number by itself and cut you off right there. Uh, but, you know, 
take that into consideration about where you want to spend the next four years because uh, there's a certain culture associated with that too. Um, okay, we'll move on. We'll move on. So, and if anybody thinks of any questions about something that we, we talked about and moved on from, we can talk at the end about it. There, there's, there's definitely not a one-way road here. <laughs> um, so supplementary materials are crucial. Uh, often the path to an A plus is not a straight line. It's not as simple as going to class, doing the homework, taking the exams, and you get an A. I wish it was that way. Often you're going to have to, um, to do things in addition to the homework. The homework should be a reflection of the exam, but it's not always that way. I've had many, many classes where the homework and the exam seemed to be on different planets, which was unfortunate. The, um, the text isn't always the best way to learn the material itself because the text tends to be comprehensive, but not necessarily user friendly. So uh, I really love for organic chemistry, uh, this class called organic Chem or this book called Organic Chemistry in Second Language. It's a super thin workbook that just teaches you the concept and has you practice them and then shows you the solutions. Super, super simple. And I ended up being in a better place than like all of my class by the end of organic chemistry one and two because i really knew the material i was doing harder stuff in my workbooks than i was doing in the class and so the homework was no problem the exams were no problem and i was able to ace both classes which was really um uh difficult it was difficult these are notorious classes and i really owe my success to these supplemental materials khan academy youtube videos um You'll find in med school, supplementary materials is like the name of the game. That's what we use all the time. We use the lectures they give us, but we're using New World, we're using ComBank, ComQuest, we're using Anki Flash Decks, we're using Robins, we're using, using all the sorts of stuff, Kaplan. Um, so definitely, definitely figure out what the best supplementary materials are for your class. You may have to do some research for that and uh, definitely start using them right away. Yeah, study every day with them. They are really the ticket to success. Uh, Chegg. So I really have a love-hate relationship with this website. Uh, is, is anybody here familiar with Chegg? Anybody use it before? I've never heard yes, of it. Yes, I have. Megana has, Tarun hasn't. Okay, so uh, Megana, you probably know what I'm talking about, the love-hate relationship. Tarun, you may have dodged a bullet, but you, you may want to check it out in the future too. Um, it is a... Oh, wait, that was a joke. Yeah, I did. I did. Oh, you have. You have. Oh, geez. All right. So, yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, so, it is a homework solution website, pretty much. So, you're working through homeworks, and uh, uh, it, it's really, really handy for math homework, um, where you'll be taking, like, a finance class or something, and uh, you can Google the, the actual question. And often it'll go right to Chegg and it'll go right to the solution, but it's a double-edged sword. So I have a lot of classmates who over relied on Chegg because I was a, a dual major. Uh, I did pre-med and I also did business when I went on and got my MBA. And um, a lot of people over relied on Chegg and they, they used it to answer all the homework. They never learned how to do the problems. And Chegg isn't always correct because the texts change frequently. The, um, if, if you're doing a finance problem, they change a couple of numbers, it totally changes the problem. So the, the stuff they would write down would be carbon copies of the homework site, Chegg, and um, it would be wrong. So I suggest using Chegg for learning how to do the problem. So if, if Chegg has a worked out problem step-by-step, that's fantastic. That, that's, that's worth the money right there because you're teaching yourself how to do the problem, learning the patterns on how to solve the problems. Um, but after you get to that point, try to do the problems on your own. Use Chegg just as the, use it kind of like a supplementary resource like we were talking about before. Uh, use it to figure out how to solve the problems, then do it on your own. And if you use the Chegg to solve a problem, wait like 48, 72 hours, and then try to redo the problem on your own. If you can remember how to redo the problem, you know the content. If you can't, without looking back at check again, you're going to have difficulty when you get to exam day. So, homework. Uh, it's usually essential to being successful in class. It's always successful if there's homework grade, but it might not always reflect your exam. Good classes will have homework that reflects 
the exam and reinforces the content concepts. Um, and the key to utilizing homework is to consider the practice run for your exams, uh, not just the homework grade. I actually recommend flagging tricky or key problems and then repeating them, maybe even multiple times. Definitely do them once to figure out how to solve the problem, do it again long before the exam to make sure you understand the content, and then do it before the exam. Your, your teachers aren't dumb, especially if they're basing the exams off the homework. I guarantee you there are gonna be problems on the exams that are versions of that homework. Now, some of the lazier teachers I have met will take it verbatim from the homework. And uh, well, if you did the homework, you are set. And if you really understood the homework, then you've just got an easy A on that exam. But if you didn't do the homework, if you didn't understand it, you've just shot yourself in the foot because that was an easy A that you just lost because you didn't do the homework or didn't understand it. Uh, so decoding the exam, that brings us to here. So prepping for an exam begins way, way before the first day of classes. You should research the class. You should research the professor. You should figure out if they do department exams or stock exams or create their own exam. Um, and you should really pick the class based off of the, the I hate to say it, but the, the exam strategy, unfortunately. Um, or at least that should be a big factor into it. Uh, if this class is great, but the exams are impossible, that's gonna hurt you down the road. You're, it's gonna affect your GPA. So it's critically important to know how the exams work for, for that class. Um, if you get a bad vibe or a bad response after talking to the teacher, if you can't find that info, you know, it, it's perfectly fine to switch sections if you still have time. Um, the, the good courses will have exams that reflect the content. The, the teachers, they really should be teaching to the exam, to the con and the content should reflect that exam. Um, it, it's, I, I kind of feel sad saying that. I really wish we could just take exams and, uh, or take classes and enjoy the class and just suck up as much material as we can, not have to worry about these things. But as Ellie was saying before, uh, a lot of these admissions committees, a lot of these applications, they're gonna look right at that number. And, you know, you can come back later and say, hey, I really enjoyed the class, but I got a C in it, and it's still gonna look bad. So that brings me to home environment. Um, so last topic today, the, uh, so I really feel bad for anybody taking classes right now online. Um, well, it's nice to be home and not have to travel and go into class and stuff like that. The amount of distractions that are at home is just horrendous. And with COVID-19, there are just so many restrictions and potential dangers with traditional study environments. Um, so it's even more important that you have space at home that's conducive to learning. Uh, so what is a conducive environment? It, that's probably an environment that's not too comfortable, unfortunately. So research shows that feeling uncomfortable is actually critical to being successful. The, that research that I, I cited was more psychological. So like if you're putting yourself in an uncomfortable position psychologically, you'll grow more. But I would say that's also true physically too. If you're too comfortable and you're studying in a room with an Xbox, uh, TV, uh, your bed in the room, the, uh, like a little fridge with all your food in it, um, your cat sitting in your lap, snacks, uh, you, you, you're going to be too relaxed. You're going to be very, very relaxed. It's going to take you forever to do stuff. Um, you may be watching a little TV as you study. Um, it, it's too, you're too comfortable. It's too comfortable of an environment. What you need to do is you really need to, to set up a, a learning environment, a learning area for yourself that's removed from distractors. This is absolutely critical. Uh, and here are some, some keys to that kind of learning environment. You need a clear desk. You're gonna need an isolated workspace if possible. This might not be possible if you're at home with parents or if you have a roommate, that might not be possible. Um, but if you can create something isolated, even if it's just as simple as throwing up a, 
a screen or something that's between you and distractions, that'll help. Uh, you want to minimize distractions, whether that means moving your distractions out of your room or moving yourself out of the room with the distractions, whatever you got to do. It, keep a strict schedule. That's going to be really, really hard this semester. You want to, if, if your class was going to be 90 minutes, you want to sit down with your material for 90 minutes, not let yourself get distracted. Uh, keep an exercise schedule. Um, keep a homework schedule. Uh, make sure you have plan breaks. And the key word there is planned. You don't want to have this kind of loosey-goosey break anytime I want kind of mentality. You want to say, okay, I'm going to study for three hours, then 15 minute break, three hours, 15 minute break. Or you can use something like the Pomodoro method, which is like uh, 55 minutes of studying, 15 minute break, and you time yourself. Whatever approach you use, and you can research a lot of these approaches, lots of good videos on YouTube, a lot of good TED Talks on it. But whatever approach you use, just stick to it. Hold yourself accountable. And one good way to hold yourself accountable is SMART goals. That stands for uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Um, and we have a nice link here. This is going to be sent out to everybody who didn't receive it already. But uh, create SMART goals for yourself. Create semester-long SMART goals. Create daily SMART goals. Create SMART goals between now and the next exam for the class. Uh, it's a great way to keep yourself accountable. Okay. Uh, I just want to add one thing. Yes. The Pomodoro method that you had mentioned before. Um, know what your limits are to start with. Um, if you know that you get distracted every five minutes, don't be like, I'm going to study for an hour straight and take 10 minutes, then study for an hour straight because you're going to now within the first 20 minutes. Slowly work your way up. 20 and 5, 20 and 5, maybe 30 and 5, 30 and 5, work your way up to something more sustainable other than going all in. Um, yeah. I found that it's helped myself and a lot of other students kind of build up the stamina. Because once you get to med school, volume becomes a lot more intense, even though the concepts aren't as hard, and that level of stamina might be more beneficial. I think having a proper work ethic developed during pre med classes or just undergrad in general is, is really helpful once you start uh, med school. I agree. And Ali, you bring up something which I, I should say, um, which is don't be too hard on yourselves, too. If you have a difficult time focusing at home, you are just like the rest of us. Um, it, it's, so don't, don't be too hard on yourself in the beginning. These are very unusual times, and you are in a very unusual position. So, you know, find the supports where you can find the supports and just do your best. And, um, We'll, we'll all get through this. So next steps, um, here's some info about joining Project Breakthrough. If you're interested in attending more events, we're going to have uh, more talks like this, uh, stuff with study skills. We're going to have some meditation classes. We'll have some de-stressing classes. Um, there's one thing that med school is and pre-medical classes are, and that is stressful. They're, they are all stressful. So we're uh, we're gonna have some some events to address that um and help re hopefully relieve some of those stress but thank you all for joining me uh joining us today and i'm gonna stop sharing and i'm gonna switch to uh answering any questions if you have any all right so I'll open up the floor uh i have a question Yes. So um, obviously, like due to the pandemic, there's not a lot of opportunities, especially when it comes to research or like scribing and clinical stuff. So what would you suggest in the time period like those? That is a really, really good question. Um, on, uh, on the good side, like you're in the same boat as everybody else. So that's, that, that's a good thing. On the bad side, it's, it's a lousy boat to be in right now. Um, I would recommend getting real creative uh, with, with what opportunities are available. Um, so you're, you're going to be barred from a lot of traditional opportunities. People are not going to want the risk of, of having a pre-med student in the hospital. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you can find a place. But I have a feeling most places are going to be like, yeah, non-essential personnel, we, just can't, we can't risk having them in here. Um, has anybody actually uh, reached out and gotten any feedback? Is, is that consistent with what you've been finding? I mean, like for like scribing, I know there's a provider called like CityMD, like urgent care. 
but they're like full time, so they require like thirty two hours. Okay. But yeah, they said like they're hiring. They are. So so scribing is still an option. That's fantastic. Um, that that I that I was wondering about if they had cut that down or made it virtual or something. Mm -hmm. Ali. Um, so in regards to I think for the question, but I'm assuming this is for shadowing research opportunities, things of that nature, correct? Uh, I know there are some places that do like virtual shadowing where you get to hop in on like telemedicine calls and things of that nature. Not exactly the same as in-person shadowing. They can give you a connection to a physician. Maybe that physician also does research. Kind of lean your way through there. Um, you can also reach out to professors. Some of them are doing you know research opportunities that aren't lab based. They may be more uh, clinical in nature. They're just based on like survey data, uh, things like that that don't have to be in person. That you can also help out and join. And as Stern said, I think I think some scribing opportunities are still doing, uh, still giving the opportunity to scribe via telemedicine. I know a friend who scribes at one of the, at St. Peter's Hospital, and he was taken out of the hospital, and he was scribing through telemedicine type service. So, uh, like Nathan said, try to be creative uh, because everyone else is on the same boat. The more creative you are, I guess the kind of like up that you get. Um, there are still opportunities that are virtual for you. Uh, just I require a little bit of extra work to look for them. This is also a really good place to um, to kind of to to tap the hive mind. Uh, so this is a, this is a good question to bring up, like on on the website too, uh, because you can get the the feedback of all the medical students in the area and other pre meds to see what they've been finding. Um, I getting creative, I think, is going to be the real key because if you can show that you were both responsible, because it it's not going to look good if you put yourself at risk. If you go take some sort of uh, volunteering option that puts you at risk, they're going to be like, ooh, is this a guy a risk taker? Is, is this somebody who, who doesn't have good judgment? You got to be careful of that. Um, but you want to, you, you do want to do something, right? And this is a, a terrific opportunity to make a real impact in the world. And so um, I would say look at kind of skills you have, right? We had one pre-med who is trying to start a, a sewing club at Rutgers, if I remember correctly. And we have these, these really tight N95 face masks we wear all the time. And I know they kill my ears. Like by the end of the day, my ears are like this. It's, it is so painful. But you can knit up things like, like mask extenders, which take the pressure off your ears and put it behind your head. They're beautiful. And so it, that's just a creative solution. And so it, it, it doesn't really replace the shadowing. It doesn't really replace the research, but it does show that you're staying active and that you're really helping people. And it's just a little thing, but it really makes, I know it makes me more comfortable at the end of the day and I have less of that tension headache. Um, I would also look into what sort of state organizations there are for um, like medical corps. Like we, we have a medical corps in New Jersey uh, and I, I'm not 100% certain what level you have to be at. I don't, I, I know you don't have to be a physician to volunteer. Pre-med might be fine or grad student or just somebody who's currently in training. And um, they used to do stuff or and I guess they're still doing stuff where they were doing uh, like um, testing stations and they would get people to volunteer and help out with that. Yeah, I mean, you won't be doing the testing, but you may be helping um, open up, I don't know, like, um, hand sanitizer in the back or something, but it, it helps. That definitely helps and it's definitely uh, something you put on your CV. So really good question. We had a very long-winded answer for it. <laughs> and don't be, don't be um, down if you aren't able to find anything. That's not gonna be a negative on your application that, oh, during this pandemic, you didn't actually, you didn't find, you weren't able to find what you wanted to do. Yeah. Anything you do now is kind of just like a bonus as long as you're responsible for it. Like if you're going on the front lines and they're just gonna be like, all right, this is poor judgment, is poor judgment. They're not, you know, yeah. trying too much to do something that they that's beyond their scope. So if you do something within a responsible manner, something virtual or help them in the back end or something. But even if you don't and you just want to focus on school or focus on extracurriculars, that's also a hundred percent okay. Like I didn't have research when I applied to medical school. It didn't really come up on any interviews. Sure, if I had it, I probably would have helped. My situation made it a little bit harder to get research. But that's a whole different story. But you can still get into these places without having your publications or anything like that. Wait, Ali, okay. I have a question. Like, you said, like, you had uh, no research, right? So, like, I'm particularly not interested in research. Mm -hmm. 
like at all because I don't really enjoy my lab classes. Mm -hmm. Like, but um, like, what is your view on that? Like, I know you said you didn't like take it, but like, do you think like I could still get into competitive programs like MD and mm -hmm. I, th I think you need to know, as long as you make up for it in other aspects of your application, let's say you don't have research, but you have working experience or really good leadership experience, those can kind of take that piece of research. Uh, and one, one thing to note is that even if you don't like lab research, like bench work, there's still clinical opportunities out there. Like a lot of med students don't really do lab research anymore. We'll go out and do like clinical surveys or case reports or things of that nature. It's just like so those might be up your alley if you don't like the bench work. Like EMT, like you mean by clinical? Like those. No, no, sorry, like um, uh, research that's more based on clinical outcomes mm. or um, just survey data from people. Like, um, I don't remember the exact project anymore, but there was one opportunity that kind of came up when my semester was very full, and it was a psych, psych related research project. I think they, they just needed help. We were doing a program and they just needed help with someone like analyzing data or, or something of that nature. It's not lab work, it's not bench work. You're still clinically uh, doing something research related, if that makes sense. So those are also options if you don't really want to do, you know, bench work and are into whatever else happens in my own chem lab. So you can basically like join a lab but not really do lab stuff by just analyzing data? Oh yeah. yeah. That and also not all labs are doing bench work. It's it's not everybody was working with cell biology and, and chemicals and there's a lot of other aspects that in healthcare like uh, programs for you know uh, I wish I could remember what that program was hmm. for example um, uh, analyzing impact of you know telemedicine on people or analyzing impact of virtual learning on uh, students mm -hmm. those aren't bench work it's still important to know what those impacts are on on students on physicians and such. That's kind of the way I was talking about. You don't have to do um, organic chemistry work. To what if what if you don't? What if you just don't want to do like research because it's like such a hassle? Edit. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Too. That's, yeah. that's fine. Um, like like I not will, even like do like the clinical things that you're saying. You know, yeah. avoid research. Say it again? Like just, like not even doing like whatever you just said, like the mm -hmm. analyzing and stuff. Yeah. But just avoiding the like the general thought of research very much. So yeah. uh, I would, you can still get into med school without having done any research. That's not an automatic barrier. Mm -hmm. However, I will say that having done joined one project kind of puts you on a higher threshold for whatever reason. It's just it just seems to be something that is valued. If you happen to do it, great. If you don't, it's not necessarily a deterrent. It's just one of those things. If you do it, it looks better. If you don't, as long as you're doing other things, that's okay. Yeah, part of it is just kind of demonstrating that you could do it or that you can appreciate it. Um, but you definitely don't have to, to, you don't have to go too deep into it, no. And, and you could do none of it at all, uh, but uh, like Ali was saying, yeah. I think it's, it's more so, there's two, there's two aspects to research. One, it shows a dedication to advancing, you know, medicine. Like if someone who does research, um, it shows med schools that you're interested enough to do more than just class stuff and you really do like the science behind it and whatnot. Um, in reality, most students are doing it just for the, you know, just to have it done. Some people really enjoy it and that's good, that's perfect. Not everyone, you know, really enjoys what they're doing. And second, there are some skills you do gain from research in terms of just like sifting through information, being able to make something more concise and succinct, uh, analyzing data, all those things are important. Uh, skill sets to learn if you don't if you happen to learn them somewhere else i don't think it'll be too big of an issue um, yeah when you apply and like also like like I as i said before like i'm applying for M i'm planning to apply for md mba mm -hmm. like i just like decided it like sophomore year so like i transferred to like the business school during sophomore mm -hmm. year so like my schedule right now like i have to take up to like i'm taking like seven classes right now just to like balance out like the med classes and also the business classes so I was just wondering if you guys like had like similar experiences because like I planned out like my four years and then like I have to take about like five, like six classes per sem and then maybe some summer classes yeah same same exact schedule as you I, I was in the business school I ended up switching to medicine so I was taking about 17-ish or 18-ish credits a semester I think I graduated with like 150 credits or something like that yeah that was um, that was my situation too. Yeah. 
yeah because like my problem is is like i need I, like i need to like raise my gpa like my gpa right now is like around like a close to a three five but it's not exactly okay. like a three five and then like my science gpa is like really low like a three point hmm. Here, here's one thing i would just say um if you think your gpa needs more more attention spend the semester focusing on your classes hmm. um you have two three what, seven other semesters, I guess depending on what, how far you're in, five, three more semesters to do this extra leadership, extra research, whatever it is. But like I mentioned before, the GPA MCAT, because it's quantifiable and it's, MCAT is at least a standardized uh, GPA, is not really, since they're quantifiable, they're very easy markers that, that programs can use because they're getting thousands of applications, right? Yeah. It would, uh, if they have enough time, I'm sure they would love to look through each application they can. So they need something to filter through, and as unfortunate as that is, it ends up being GPA and MCAT. Um, and it's like Nathan, thing, you got to be strategic with how you're how you're doing these things, right? Uh, you could have like you know six leadership projects, but if your GPA is way below average, it's not really going to put you on the radar because they look at that number first before delving into everything else. If you think you need the semester, just focus on your grades, not do research. Do like maybe stick to one or two clubs. Mm -hmm. That's definitely understandable, and that's not going to be that will help you, I think, in the long run, because your GPA would still be solid instead of having to explain why your GPA was lower. It's easy. It's easier to explain why you've done three extracurriculars as opposed to four than to explain why your GPA is lower than average. Wait, did you guys like do like a business like internship just to like for the MBA MBA MBA, MBA program? Oh, so um, uh, I'm the only one who completed it in the entire school, which we're hoping to change soon. I'm hoping, hoping some more med students will do it. Um, I didn't, although they've made changes to our MBA program. Um, and there's an MBA fellowship now, which is really cool, uh, which does include kind of like that, that internship experience. Uh, what I did was I joined a startup company. And um, so I got a lot of the internship experience with the startup company as I was taking the MBA classes. Okay. This, um I don't know if like, since like I'm a finance major, I don't know if like I need like a finance centered internship or just like any work, like any like internship. It, it depends on what your career goals are, I would say. Um, just uh, an MBA, MBA pretty much. Just trying oh, to get Then any, anything really. I would, even, even if you wanted to do something, you know what? Yeah, even if you somebody wanted to do something finance focused, I, I still think they would appreciate somebody who's a generalist who can appreciate the other aspects of business. Okay. Because like, like I don't have that many like internships. Like I have like two counting as mm -hmm. of right now. So mm -hmm. like, I don't know like if I should improve on that. But like also at the same time, like I'm I'm planning to like I have to like improve my GPA and like I have like seven classes. I'm taking chem two and physics, mm -hmm. which like is hard for me. And then like I have like three leadership positions like on top of that. So yeah. like, I don't know like what you guys like suggest like if like I should pursue like internship or push that back to like junior year i would i would recommend pushing it back and then uh doing some research into exactly what the classes um that go into the science gpa are because some 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 may look like they might be calculated with the science gpa but they turned out that, like they're not i remember dealing with that problem myself um and then looking at community college just bring up your grade through the community college for your science gpa they they really, so the schools, when you apply, they're going to be hit with that number first, right? It's only as they dig into it, they're going to be like, oh, okay, he took this class, this class, and this class, community college. But your, your GPA will already be bumped up. You, you already get the benefit from it. So that's what I would recommend. Okay. Because, um, mm -hmm. like, I, I, like, as I said before, like, I already completed, like, a four-year plan of my classes. It's like mm -hmm. I really don't have like space at right. classes because because like the business class is on top of like the workers core mm. and then just science classes like the bedrocks. One thing you may want to do is use some of those grade tracking tools to figure out if you haven't done this already to figure out what the best case scenario is for your GPA at the not at the end of the four years but at the point where you're applying. Okay. Because I'm planning to also like take a gap year too before, if I do decide still to go into medicine. Cool. 
like definitely like to like you know get clinical hours because corona all that stuff like i have like no freedom as like because the classes i don't really have that many too much that much time to like yeah. get like, a scribing job or like you know it so it it's i, I don't want to I don't want you to focus too much on the GPA. It's important. It's a key piece. But a, a lot of schools, the really good schools, they look at you holistically as a candidate. So if your GPA is a little low, an average is just an average, right? So if your GPA is a little below the average, but you are a stellar candidate, because you have all these leadership um, um, uh, experiences, you have all these internship experiences, you're a diverse candidate, you have the business and the medical part of it, um that's 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 going to say a lot too mm -hmm. so don't don't get too fixated on the number a lot of people do a lot of people get fixated on the number what um wait what like like we're both like you said you were initially like a site like a philosophy major yeah philosophy major and then ali was like a business major like what yep. did you guys like what like kind of triggered you guys to like switch to medicine though uh well how about you first ali what triggered you to switch to medicine so for me, it was more of uh, finding some finding a balance between stuff I enjoyed learning and stuff I learned doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, as I went through my business courses, I wasn't as invested as I thought I was going to be. Although I did, I did think the like entrepreneurial aspect was exciting. I wasn't really going through classes thinking this, you know, I'm, yeah, I get to go through marketing class again. <laughs> yeah, uh, but true. you know, when you when I looked into like medicine, it was the I mean, we learned about like plants and random things in bio, but like the human body stuff seemed very interesting. And then when I went to go shadow a physician, I was like, I can see myself doing this every day. Uh, and, and medicine is so flexible in that you could always combine different things. You could take medicine and public health and it goes together. You could take medicine and business and open up a clinic and put those together. You could take medicine and technology and go through into medical innovation and put those together. There's just so much flexibility that if I decided I didn't want to be purely, con yeah, purely clinical, I could always branch off and add something else. Uh, so for me, that flexibility plus just knowing I, I was okay, I liked the day to day and the learning aspect, I kind of sealed the deal for me. I um, I, I echo a lot of what what Ali said. I, I find that was true for myself too. But I also um, I'm a pretty greedy person. I got to say, at the end of the day, I uh, I really liked philosophy because it went into a lot of really, really cool, high level introspective topics. I really liked counseling because I liked working with people and I liked the psychology behind it. And I, I just wanted to know everything, honestly. And uh, medicine was like the next logical step for that in my quest to know everything in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's what brought me to medicine. <laughs> I don't know, like I'm kind of like, like I took like, business classes of course and I kind of enjoyed them like first year and then I took financial accounting and I hate it yeah, financial accounting is hard that was a hard class like it's not even like like I just like came to like a realization that like the business classes were like they're like like of course they're like going to be easier than med classes but they weren't like I guess like challenging for like to like be enjoyable I guess right they're creative it, they're yeah. way more creative uh, from, uh, that's what I enjoyed in the business classes and there's less of a um, there's a lot more gray space in the business classes, I feel. Like uh, like orgo problem. I mean, there's a right answer to the wrong answer, but marketing, there's a million right answers. Yeah, so. I mean it's just like it's just like the risk, the risk in like med school. It's just like, I don't know, just like I hear you. I hear you. I I experienced that not too long ago. <laughs> did you have something to ask? I noticed you unmuted. Um, so one thing, so I'm also a bio major and I'm doing a minor in computer science. So the reason behind like why I'm doing computer science is like, by all means, like if med school is not going to work out for me after I graduate, and even if I take that gap semester, then I would probably do a master's in computer science. And like, because I do have an interest in computer science, it's not like, it's just a second option. It's also something that I look towards as well but med is my priority at the moment. So obviously like I kind of like have a backup, but like I was just wondering as well, like what Turin was asking, if you need internships from both sides of the field to actually like be able to see if you're like in 
whatever you're trying to do? That's, that's a really, it, it is a really good question. Like the, the internship really does give you exposure to the real, the realities of, of the field. Um, and it's a really smart plan. It, uh, your plan to do bio and computer science is a great combination. Bio business, bio computer science, it, it's, it's it, both of those are, are never going to, um, th there's never not going to be. Like, yeah. There's, it's always in demand for Absolutely. obviously both of those jobs, but obviously I would um, want to, my goal is to obviously get into med school. So that's something. It's that's a good goal. It's a good goal. And, and you'll be even more diverse in, with bio, medicine, computer science background. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's definitely a good goal. Um, the, the opportunities, if you go into, if you, Get into med school and I'm, I'm confident everybody here with hard work who wants to go to med school can get into med school um, the opportunities after your physician will come they'll, they'll they'll be there if you want them it's it's nobody's going to turn down doctor doctor uh, to hear from um, from being more involved with the business side of the hospital it's mm -hmm. it's yeah it's just not going to happen. Um, or you could just do your own thing because when you get to a, a terminal level degree like that, when there's a doctor before your name, there's just so many doors that open up. Um, there's a lot of startups for, for everybody here. If anybody wanted to, um, to do stuff in the future after going to med school, there's a lot of startups that would jump at having a med student or a physician being involved with them because it is such a, a difficult degree to get. So the opportunities, you, you don't have to feel that they're only right now. Mm -hmm. they're, they're gonna be far into the future and they're always gonna be there. Yeah. It's just like medicine, it's very competitive. So obviously mm -hmm. the applicants, the number of applicants applying, like it's very selective. So it's just something. Exactly. Obviously what diversifies from you from everyone else. Definitely might be a little bit biased but I think there is a benefit to having a non-science degree uh, I mean if you enjoy neuroscience if you enjoy chemistry by all means do that pick a major that you're actually interested in I think there's a benefit to having a non-clinical background because healthcare is an industry and industries are not just patients there is a business aspect to it there is a policy aspect to it there is an administrative aspect to it um, Having that broader skill set, I think, makes you a little bit more um, one appealing when you become an actual physician, and two, you just have a different mindset that allows you to see more opportunities. Uh, in my opinion, I mean, I'm not a physician, so but from what I've been seeing, what I kind of gather, I think having that you know, computer science minor or business major, whatever it is, yeah, will help more in the long run, even if the short term you may not be as accustomed to some of the science terminology that others are. A lot, of, a lot of great questions. Any, any more? I think we can do one last one. That's a good idea. Hey, buddy. Okay. It's okay if, if there aren't any more. Uh, we'll, we'll do more of these. Um, well, hopefully this was helpful to everybody. And if you're watching at home, the recording of this, hopefully it was helpful. We didn't give you any terrible advice. And if we did, we're going to shut off the comments for our YouTube channel so you can't call us on it. So, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we'll have more of these announced pretty soon. And uh, we really appreciate everybody joining us. And of course, uh, check out our website, Project Breakthrough, pbthrough.com. And um, if you're a pre-med student, we'll get you hooked up with a mentor or many mentors. And if you're a medical student, uh, come be a mentor. So thanks. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Bye.